What is Algonquin Park is very interesting because I think it's so many things to so many people. In and of itself, it is an iconic natural area uh, of Canada. It has provided enormous cultural inspiration in the form of art and music. The Group of Seven being perhaps the foremost uh, in inspired Canadians by the, sh the landscape. It's recreation from camping to fishing to travel um, and uh, long family histories too. I've talked to so many people who have spent generation after generation coming up to Algonquin Park. Um, so really what it is, is it, I think it encapsulates, encapsulates kind of the, uh, the Canadian persona. It's natural history, it's cultural history. Um, it is just rugged, untamed wilderness. And for a lot of people, it's just sheer magic. My name is Patrick Bulldown. I am a graduate student, PhD student at the University of Toronto. Uh, I'm here up at the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station studying salamanders and turtles for my doctoral research. Uh, I'm also communications officer for the research station here, so as a member of the board of directors, uh, also assisting with day-to-day -day duties and helping, to, uh, helping with public education and promotion of the station. I mean, since, since the station's inception in 1944, it's just been this really fertile training grounds for uh, ecology and conservation, um, not only here in Ontario, but for students across Canada and internationally, for that matter, as well. People are always sharing their knowledge, and it's, it's phenomenal what you can learn in such a short period of time, too. Because it's so hands-on, because it's so practical, um, really the possibilities are endless. In any given day you can go out with one research team, completely diversify your skill set and your knowledge base. It's incredible to think when you get together at dinner with all the other crews, you hear, you know, what did the wolf people see today out in the field? Oh, you just caught a turtle? Well, it was last seen in, you know, 1983. How cool is that? You never know what to expect when you get up in the morning and how that day is going to finish. There's a really good sense of camaraderie, friendship, and friendships that last a lifetime. I can't think of a better place to acquire such a diverse skill set uh, and, and such a unique place with such an accomplished history for that matter too. So yeah, ultimately it was in, it was in uh, 1944 when the research station was established with the premise of establishing these ecological baselines, monitoring going forward to provide reference sites for what a healthy ecosystems look like.
So my name is Stephen Kell and I'm a researcher here at the Wildlife Research Station in Algonquin Park. Uh, so I'm currently a master's student at Laurentian University uh, going into my second year at my master's um, and I'm working here on the Algonquin Turtle Project. So what I'm, I'm trying to look at is uh, I'm trying to quantify the effect of roads on turtle populations. Uh, so what I'm doing exactly is we have uh, eight wetlands along the highway uh, and these are my impact sites so uh, sites where turtles are going to be most affected uh, turtles that will come out possibly nesting on the side of the road uh, dispersing to new habitats finding mates uh, and they're going to come in contact with the roads uh, the roadways and the vehicles on the roads um, so possibly dying uh, getting injured uh, and this is going to affect the wetlands and then in comparison i'll compare these to wetlands over five kilometers away uh, and to get to these uh, wetlands uh, that far away uh, I'm going to be traveling down logging roads as well as canoe route sites. So you can see we've already caught this one this year, so this is uh, notch 1142. Yeah, they can reach their heads back really far, mm -hmm. but they can't reach them down at all, so it's pretty safe with my hand here. And when it's right on the bottom like that, you can't scratch yeah. them either. <laughs> they eat basically anything. Uh, a large portion of their diet actually consists of vegetation and carrion. They really like lily pad seeds, so they actually actually dispersers of the lily pad seeds and then they also eat like tadpoles frogs fish um, they can take down uh, anything really their body size or smaller uh, they're not really active hunters but as if it's kind of if they're in the shallows and it swims by right above them they'll grab onto their leg pull it underwater drown it and then they actually use these uh, gigantic front claws to like rip it to shreds uh, and into pieces that it can actually eat. The biggest one in our study is about 18 and a half kilograms. So, wow. yeah, he, he's probably probably around 35 pounds, maybe. Uh, yeah, Henry's like yeah, 45. Henry's, yeah, almost 45. At his max, he was about 50 pounds. So. Is this one Henry? This isn't Henry. Oh, no. okay. What is this one's name? Uh, this one doesn't have a name, it's oh. just 1142, yeah. <laughs> These are the Antler flies, they're really super aggressive as you can see. Um, they are always fighting each other, but they'll fight anything that lands on the antler. Other flies, things that are like 10 times their size, beetles. When I first got here, I spent about three weeks searching for antlers in the woods, going off the trail um, to places that moose density is really high. Um, unlike deer, which will drop their antlers in these big antler sheds and, and you can sort of go to one place and find a whole bunch of antlers, moose drops, drop their antlers kind of randomly. Um, and so I've had to travel around and just sort of bl blindly look um, until I found antlers, um, which was hard. Yeah, so an antler is about good for um, uh, four or five years after falling off. 
The maximum that uh, an antler fly has ever lived is about 30 days. Um, I've never had one live that long. Uh, they mostly live about 15 days, uh, but the whole life cycle takes about a year. But the thing that I'm, I'm really curious about for antler flies is, um, I you know spent three weeks looking for antlers and I did find a couple, um, but they're really far dispersed and randomly. Um, and nobody knows how antler flies find new antlers. Um, like I said, an antler will only last for so many years, four or five years, and after that, um, they all have to go and colonize a new antler. Um, and so for such a tiny creature to cover all that ground, um, they must have a really good sense of smell or something um, to find new antlers. And I, you know, I wish I had that sense of smell. <laughs> I think some people find it a little bit isolating to be out here, um, and it certainly is that, but I don't, I don't mind it. I'm really glad to be here with just sort of the, you know, 10 to 15 of us that are here at any time, um, and to get to live in such a beautiful place. My cabin is just overlooking the lake, and, um, you know, there's trees everywhere. Uh, it's not like this in Ottawa. So we're out here in the forests of Algonquin. Last night I set 80 Sherman traps to catch some small mammals. So hopefully we've caught some deer mice, some squirrels, some chipmunks, a couple of voles, maybe a couple of jumping mice too. So we're gonna see who's in our traps. We're gonna record measurements like if they're adults, juveniles, their sex, their, if they're reproductively active or not, as well as we're gonna see if they have ear tags and if not we're gonna give them some ear tags so we can identify who's who. And so this is uh, North America's longest small mammal project and it's also one of the world's longest ecological studies. So we look at abundance and different life history and different pop population statistics on small mammals. Yeah, so we got a deer mouse. Hmm. So this is a deer mouse. She's an adult female. Because, so females have a little pseudo penis, so sometimes it's a little hard to tell. But the dis distance between that and the anus, because it's so close, it tells me it's a female. And she's kind of like nice and pink up there, mm -hmm. so she's reproductively mature. And then they all get ear tags, so I, we know when we catch someone again. Yeah, so this one here, this is a woodland jumping mist. They have a very nice bright gold color. Yeah, they have these crazy long feet. They're about twice the size of the deer mouse's and they're obviously for jumping. And I think if my stats are right, they can jump up to a meter in length. This one's new. So 
that's what the great thing is about all these long-term studies that we do. So you're seeing stuff before you know it's happening. So this is great to see if maybe climate change will have an impact on the small mammals. Um, we're also seeing how small mammal, their populations is growing or crashing over time. So there's been a few years ago, there was a big woodland jumping mouse crash. We don't know why exactly. But so we look at things like that and also um, so at least since 1994, there's been this kind of orange substance on the ears and genitals of the small mammals. And it's only in 2015 that researchers dig, dug like a little more to figure out what that was. And it turns out it's mites and it might even be a new species of mites. So we're doing more research on that to see if it's only found here, if it is new, what it's doing to the small mammals. I think the big, one of the big challenges of today, unfortunately, is that a lot of academic institutions are shying away from hands-on experience. Things like field courses where students actually get out of the lecture hall and they get off into the field, you know, they ID plants not from a book and not from pictures, but from actually having the specimen in hand. Um, these sorts of things a lot of institutions seem to be shying away from only because it's complex to arrange, uh, it's hard to get people out into the field. The students of today maybe aren't having that same hands-on aspect. Of course, a lot of environmental research really hinges upon uh, a government that is supportive of environmental initiatives. Um, because without that, without the support of people, um, obviously a, a facility like this cannot continue to exist. The research that we collect here doesn't mean anything unless people know about it. So if people know, they'll care, and if they care, ultimately, the thought is that they'll support it further. A lot of these long-term studies have taught us invaluable things because we've been provided with such an excellent outdoor laboratory, this unparalleled natural space in which to conduct large natural experiments, watch nature unfold, um, and ultimately protect what is a vital part of our natural and cultural heritage.